Good morning and praise the Lord, everyone. Okay. Ah, catch my breath for some reason. All right. All right. So, a heap of material, a great big uh, subject, and um, we better get started. Uh, I'll limit my extemporaneous uh, comments <laughs> at the beginning. I get inspired sometimes. So we we'll just hold it to the lesson. The doctrine of God. What a great place to begin in Psalm 19, 1 through 4. It's not up there right now. But I was just, I was just seeing if y'all had eyeballs, um, checking to see if I could get eye contact with anybody. Uh, this scripture goes under the topic to begin with, uh, the, the beginning part of our discussion, uh, which we have some scriptures and subcategories to uh, go along with this to underscore the existence of God. Uh, we'll read that other scripture and a little bit later that, that talks about faith. So we know that we must believe that God is. That is that God even exists and that he exists for us but um, in order to even uh, get any place with God but we're going to talk about the existence of God and uh, mentioning the argument of cause the argument of cause has to go with the uh, um, discussion of argumentation and debate and that sort of thing. It's more of a secular type of uh, thing to uh, look at subjects where you have uh, pros and cons in subjects. And there'll be plenty of people that will get up and want to debate with you about the non-existence of God. But we have one of the most profound things and when you woke up this morning and opened up your blinds, there it was. Mr. Sun travels every morning, every morning, from the east to the west in the evening, it will set. How beautiful the sunrise, how beautiful the sunset. And there's many things that begin with that, poets talk about it, talk about it as the beginning of things in your life, the birth being the dawn, the death being sunset, and so on. So we have a lot of poetry out there that is connected with this. The heavens declare the glory of God, and we see that, well, not as much as we would like, in uh, Indiana, but uh, Mr. Sun shows up uh, a little better in, in some other parts of, of the world. Back in Ohio, it was basically the same kind of weather. Overcast skies is quite prevalent in this part of, uh, of the country. Romans 1.20 underscores this subject the existence of God, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Speaking of unbelievers, um, this lesson of necessity and I say there's nothing wrong with it. Sometimes a speaker likes to get up and talk 
and uh, sometimes just to hear themselves and uh, maybe uh, pleasing speech and voice and so on um, makes it nice for a hearer. But the most important thing that we can do and the most is to speak it and hear it. For faith cometh by the hearing of God, does it not? So uh, you may not get as much faith out of what I have to say in my comments, but faith comes and is born of, created by, the word of God. So I'm going to be reading quite a bit of scripture today, and uh, we'll see how far we get. Uh, we're we're on the down of the uh, first half hour of class. A lot of preliminaries. Creation's design, the incredible orderliness and complexity of the universe, from atoms to galaxies, testifies to the existence of the designer. All you have to do is contemplate that. Astronomers ought to believe, of all people, ought to believe in God. God's being, that is his existence. How could we even have the concept of a transcendent God unless he placed it in our minds and hearts? Where would the thought come from? Where would we contemplate that? Or why? But he put it into our hearts. That empty place. That, that hole that Brother Julian talks about. We all have that place that's waiting, that vacant place that's waiting on him. He put it there because he wants a relationship with his creation, M the morality of God, Romans 2.15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or excusing one another. Morality, the morality that's put within our hearts because we are in God's own image. Morality comes from God. It's born of God. And that part of us that is of God demands that there be an immor uh, uh, a morality and that thing we, that accuses us or excuses us is a conscience. God put it there. The existence of God answers the ageless question. Why does everyone have a conscience? And why does every human society have some concept of morality? Unlike the animal. I lost my place. Uh, Brother Lucas uh, knows what that's about. Um, just a second. I'd do better with this. That might help. When they do the computer, you know, they click a button and it moves it up like that. So, I, you know, they can keep track of it more like that. But a lot of, a lot of stuff written on the page here. Congruity. The definition of congruity is agreement or consistency, appropriate and suitable. Psalm 14 1 gives us the best explanation in light of all of the evidence that we've talked about here. The fool has said in his heart that there is no God. They are corrupt. They, are, they have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. How can we say there is no God in light 
of all of the evidence past my thinking. I think we're so busy about things. Um, the people of the world are so busy about winning, success, gaining, or the other side, pleasure, entertainment, and foolishness. We talked about this, and that is the faith, faith that's in the heart. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that is, that he exists, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. My mind goes back to when I first believed that he, that I could find some relief, that is a reward of seeking him. That I could find forgiveness of sin, that is a reward of seeking him. That's the first reward, a clean heart, a clear conscience. Follow that up with baptism, you talk about an experience. Wow, that was a clearing experience. Amen. And it's hard to forget. I, I remember that clearly at age 13. My going down into the water in that old place. <laughs> wow. Next, uh, after the existence of God, let's talk about the nature of God. And this we will talk about two uh, major categories. And that is God's attributes. First, we'll discuss the non-moral attributes. This uh, scripture is so familiar uh, to apostolic people, especially and Bible uh, students. Exodus 3.14, the declaration, I am that I am. It expresses not only God's self-existence, but also his nature. We, we know from experience, from an experiential uh, standpoint, many of us have been healed. We know him as a healer, a redeemer, and in so many other ways we have experienced the Lord. We found actually, and we have put it into song, many, many songs, He's, he's all that I need. He's everything to me. And so it is that God is a God who can supply all, who is sufficient in himself to be all that we need. And the miraculous thing, day or night, God knows no limit in time, whenever we need him. And wherever we need him, God exists and is close. His presence actually fills the house. Sometimes we walk in, he's still here even though we're not thinking about him. It's when we bring him into our consciousness that we feel him. And we call him close. That's like, that's stepping in. To the th over the threshold and into his presence when we view the throne of God and we approach. And he says, approach. Bring to me all your needs. Hebrews tells us to come and to seek him. Hebrews 11.6 But without faith it is impossible to please him. For we, he that cometh to God, we just read this, but it fits under this, must believe that he is and that he is, is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God's attributes are awesome and especially to those born again, spirit-filled and living in close relationship with him who experience him as the psalmist did. Psalm 150 and verse 2, praise him for his Mighty acts. That's how we experience him. 
from the washing away of our sins, from, from the time of forgiveness for our sins, and all through our life in our daily walk and fellowship with him, we experience his mighty acts. It's the, you know, it's those daily experiences that you have, actually, that builds a relationship with God and brings us closer to him. Uh, the apostle talked about building a, a building. And so a, that's how we do a relationship. And that is brick by brick, prayer by prayer. And Isaiah said it this way, line upon line and precept upon precept. Uh, and so it is step by step as we take, as we call it, the journey of life. And it is those daily experiences with God, those mighty acts, that we build up a great praise. So much so that it bursts forth in uh, according to his excellent greatness. Psalm 152. Then let us speak of his nature. And let us reach for the meaning in I am that I am. That is his attributes. God is a spiritual being. John 4.24 God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Secondly, God is life. John 1 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. 1 John 1 1 and 2, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen. This I tell you, when I read this scripture, this is so precious. To think that they sat and in close contact with the Lord Jesus like this. They physically, but we in a spiritual way connect with him in the same way. Now, read what it, it says, which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. Wow. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto to us. John, who is known as the beloved dis, uh, disciple, is speaking to you and me through that loving relationship probably felt more of him than the others. Otherwise, it would not be known that he was the beloved disciple. It overwhelmed him and how he put that into writing so that we could understand his feelings toward uh, the Lord Jesus, but also the very experience of doing that, which they all, no doubt, had occasion to do. Uh, third, that God is individual. Now, Normally, we, we wouldn't need to define this, but let's, let's have a little understanding of, of this word because it seemed a little different to me. Uh, but definition of it is, it's an adjective. It a distinguished, distinguished by special, singular, marked, personal characteristics or existing as a distinct, indivisible entity. God. Indivisible. I know that there are some that divide him up and have for a long time, but we don't divide him up like that, do we? We understand that God is one. 
Genesis 1 through 3, in the beginning, God, that is, alone, all by himself, created the heavens and the earth. I'll let it go at that. And further, we've discussed this just recently in Bible study in the P52, Genesis 1, 26 and 7, and God, that is, Elohim, which is plural, speaking of God, and then we just said that he was indivisible. It is speaking of, uh, the plurality speaks of majesty. So we, we would talk about that uh, here. Let us, that is the plurality of attributes, not persons. So we'll discuss that later under Almighty. Make, um, let us make man in our own image after our likeness and let them alone have dominion over the world. So I'll slip on. Four, God is rational. Isaiah 1, 18. I'm glad that he's <laughs> rational, not... Yeah, <laughs> a lot of folks, they get heat of the moment, you know, make decisions on the heat of the moment. It, he doesn't do that. He just said, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. It, it, you know, that rational uh, thinking like that is what gives us hope that when we fall, we can get back up and he will strengthen us, forgive us, and help us on our way. And we understand that of God, so we understand that he will speak to you and talk to you and encourage you. And that's part of the comfort that he brings to you as the comforting spirit. He comes and reasons when, with you. Especially when we say we can't make it. We've, we've gone over the limit. Uh, it's impossible to do anything about it. I say all of these things, the Spirit says, now, we'll sit down here and we'll talk about this a little bit. They say, you're looking at your side of it and your limitations. And let's look at it from my standpoint. You see, I can do anything. And I can go anywhere. So, we pray for our relatives that are not even close to us. We pray for our church members that are not close to us. And so it is we place people and things in God's hand when we can't do anything about it. And that's rational thinking. He put that in our capability because that is part of his nature. Wilt thou say then unto me, why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? His will. That's that rational part of God. Then God is invisible. John 1.18, no man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. He hath declared him. So I guess maybe that's why we like the red letter words, we think. That's a better <laughs> declaration. <laughs> First Timothy 6.16 says, Who only hath immortality, dwelling in light, which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting of man. Then let's talk about the self -ex God is self-existence. The existence of God, it is. And that is um, what we read before, of course. Uh, Exodus 3.14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent you. I'm glad for the authority that comes from God. He said, well, I, I'm not speaking for myself. I'm speaking on behalf of the Lord. 
it gives you a little bit more authority, doesn't it? So it, and um, that's necessary because sometimes you might be speaking to someone who doubts or fears. You say, well, I, I might not be able to take your fear. But the Lord says that you should not fear. God is eternal. I'll skip a little. God is eternal. Deuteronomy 33, 27. The eternal God is thy refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. We love to sing it, don't we? And he shall tr thrust out the enemy from before thee and shall say, destroy him. Wow. God is eternal. Now unto him... Now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. God is omnipresent, that is, present everywhere at the same time. Psalm 139 and 7, this is an amazing scripture. I love to read it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven and thou, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light unto me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness, the light, are both alike to thee. My card. Uh, for a, a more reading, you might look at Acts 17, 21 through 28. That's great reading, but it's uh, lengthy. I'll, I'll skip it here because of time. Then let's talk about God as being omnipotent, that is, almighty, infinite in power, having very great or unlimited authority or power. First Timothy 6.15, which is, is his times, in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And 19, 19th chapter of Revelation, verse 6, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God, omnipotent, reigneth. The word omnipotent, actually occurs only once in the entire Bible. We see that power, that almighty power, everywhere from Genesis to Revelation. But only here, at the end of Revelation, is he declared to be omnipotent. The more frequent word <clears throat> that we're familiar with is used, and we often sometimes... Uh, declare it in praise to God, understanding that he is almighty, the almighty God. A term for God meaning sufficient or all-powerful, which is used 48 times in the Old Testament and nine times in the New Testament. And I notice that the first time in Corinthians, it is a quote from the Old Testament. Genesis 17, 1, we see the first occurrence of it as God revealed himself to Abram. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. <clears throat> the word Almighty, or the term and name of God, is from Hebrew, Shaddai, Strong's 7706 number, and meaning power, powerful one, or the mighty one. And it is 
we go back to the word Elohim, and it is plural. Shaddai is plural, as Elohim is plural. It denotes <clears throat> a fullness of divine strength and the sum of powers displayed by God. It in no wise ref refers to uh, a divided God. We read before, he's indivisible. You can't divide up God. And he can do it all by himself, the one true God. And that's how Abraham understood him and the patriarchs understood him as one. And so they approached one God, God Almighty. We know him as El Shaddai, El coming from Elohim. That is Elohim uh, uh, Shaddai. So they shortened it as to El. In it, and it is the, the first revealed name, the first revealed name of God, which was given to Abraham, who in this instance, in just a little while here, in the same chapter, his name is changed from Abram to Abraham, and it is in connection with the covenant of circumcision which was given to him at that time. So he, it, it is a covenant name, and Abram and God entered into covenant that they would circumcise all of the male children. The patriarchs then knew him as El Shaddai until the time of Moses. The Jewish rabbis believed the term meant the one who is self-sufficient. God's covenant then, that is, the covenant of circumcision with Abraham, it had a great circumference and it was moral and ethical in character that is opposed to ritualistic. It, it had nothing to do with ritual. It was a relationship that they had and that is a moral and ethical relationship that Abraham actually was already enjoying. In Exodus 6.3, And I appeared unto Abraham, God is declaring to Moses, unto Isaac and unto Jacob by the name God, or El, Almighty, but by my name Jehovah, that is the un unspeakable, the translation is given in the English version Jehovah but it actually comes out as the unspeakable name of God YHWH which was which I was not was I not known to them it's um, the way they the King James says uh, what the verb before the <laughs> before the noun was I not known unto them so after Moses then, God had revealed, which was a covenant name, a new covenant that he created then in deliverance and salvation, and that is reveal himself as Jehovah. The key to the meaning of the unspeakable name, that is YHWH, is unquestionably given in, in God's revelation of himself to Moses by the phrase, I am that I am, in Exodus 3.14 and 6.3. We must connect the name Jehovah with the Hebrew verb to be, with the inference that it expresses the essential, eternal, unchangeable being of Jehovah. But more, it's more than that. It is absolute truth. It is practical revelation of God and it is in his essential and changeable relation to his chosen people and it was the basis of the covenant that he made with them. 
God didn't change. And God had the power to make an everlasting covenant, and he did. The Almighty then, in the New Testament usage, this, this title belongs to the same God, of course, as the Old Testament, as the Creator, but expresses more that it is his relationship to all that he has created. And by the exercise of his power over all the works of his hand. And so Revelation, actually, it is used once in Corinthians and then picks it up in, and is declared, God Almighty is declared many times right there, uh, eight times actually, in the book of Revelation. And those are the only occurrences in the New Testament. The primary usage of it comes from the Old Testament. We have a great understanding of it. But I'll tell you what it did. That language put it into our vocabulary. When we lift our hands and praise him, oftentimes we declare that he is almighty. And isn't that, uh, that isn't that inspiring and hope raising? I'll tell you, it is a lifter up of your head when you're hanging down and you've got trouble that you're dealing with, a dark spot you have going through in your life. But I tell you, calling on the Almighty God will brighten the day for you and make that valley a little higher and bring the mountain down a little bit lower yeah, because you know that you are in relationship with that same God that spoke to Abraham, revealed himself to the patriarch repeatedly and then revealed himself as a man. That same one revealed himself, came in flesh, and gave himself for us. God is omniscient. That is, he's having complete or unlimited knowledge, awareness, and understanding, perceiving all things. Some scary at times, but uh, Psalm 139, verse 1 through 6 O oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting, mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O oh Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before. And, la th and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Isn't it wonderful to know God like that? Job 42 and 2 says, I know that thou canst do everything. I, I thought this would be such a great scripture to read around, around prayer time. The declaration of the man who was in the midst of uh, what the Bible describes. We sure, certainly want to go through probably one of the stiffest, tr long trials that anyone uh, was described going through throughout all of Scripture. But he said, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Acts 2.23, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and for knowledge of God, knowing everything he we, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Next, God is immutable, that is unchangeable or change less. Uh, let's look at mutable. He is immutable. Look at mutable, that's liable or subject to change and alteration. Aren't you glad your covenant and your walk with God is not like that? Given to changing? <laughs> Woo! Uh, I've been in uh, relationships that was like that. Uh, kind of rocky, I'd say. Constantly changed. Uh, not this woman, I tell you what. She's like a rock. A rock. I look into my rock. <laughs> so, second to God, she stands right there. And then mutable is, I like this one, fickle. Fickle. 
Malachi 3, 6, said, for I am <coughs> almost bit caught. <coughs> for I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, that just hit me what, what that means, you know. <laughs> wow, I read that uh, several times, but it never hit me like that. Wow. <sighs> right now I'm thinking, see, he, he's a God of tender, loving kindness. <laughs> that, that he's gentle, and that he's forgiving, and that he's merciful. They say, it's a good thing, I am all that, and I don't change, because otherwise uh, you'd be gone. <laughs> James 1, 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, cometh down from the Father of life, with whom there is no variableness, no change with God. Aren't you glad? He makes a promise and he keeps it. He says it is and it is. So the gifts, the gifts of God are given without repentance. The calling of God is given without repentance. He doesn't change his mind on you. He said, if he ever thought you could do it, and he promised you that way, or called you to do, he never changed his mind. And we slip out the back door sometime, but he would be right on our tracks and remind us, I believed in you. Believe in me. Wow. All the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? So, oh, the last of these, uh, God is one. And of course, we are familiar with this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. One Lord. But we'll slip through these uh, rather quickly. I never thought I'd get this far. Moral, the moral attributes. We just discussed the non-moral. We'll talk about the moral attributes. That is, God, first of all, is holy. We know him as a Holy God, for I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt, that unholy place, <laughs> to be your God. And you shall be holy, for I am holy. Wow. So we ought to live, when we live in relationship with the Holy God, it calls us unto holiness, does it not? God is just and righteous, so, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. And then we know that God is love. John declares, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. For God commendeth his love toward us, in Romans 5, 8, that in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Then God is a God of mercy and grace. Psalm 103, 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. I see. I know I try that sometimes probably. I try him on that, but I'm sure glad he's consistent that he doesn't change. He's always the same. I find him when I pray, when I come to him, every time I come to him, he's so constant. There he is in the same spirit, receiving, gracious, forgiving kind and gentle but Romans 11:22 declares both sides behold therefore the goodness and, and severity of God on them which fell severity but toward thee goodness 
and he uses this little language that keeps us on our toes if thou continue in his goodness otherwise thou shalt be cut off that's a stern warning isn't it a stern stern warning i think that uh we need that you know it's a it's a i, I think of this and i'm going to finish it off with it i have a few more points but i want to finish it off with this because it's with their that, that time in our families coming the children that we bring, if we have more than one, all we need is two. The difference is between the children. And you have one compliant. It doesn't make any difference. You know, the rules you set down, the things you say, they're compliant. And in, um, I think of Philip, as he was like this. And, I'm not going to talk about my other kids. I, because just because I don't want to compare them in front of you, I just won't. Anyway, but all I had to do was just look at Philip. That's all. And he, if he thought I was displeased with him, he'd break out crying. It'd crush him to think that I was displeased, or that he displeased. Me, well, mom could do it too, but I guess maybe dad. I don't know that thing. But you know, children they grow up that way, and they, they, you got you know, as a police officer, you find out that kind, don't you? You I mean, brush shoulders more with the other kind that's not so compliant. You have they need somebody to give them a helping hand. So, I guess maybe that's why Paul entered this, this language that he uses here, this verbiage, to let those, I say, maybe like the brush toward the incorrigible ones, <laughs> the ones that want to try the system, you know, uh, and all of that, um, let you know that God doesn't change with that too, he's holy. He wants his people to be holy. It really isn't that hard, is it? When you have a heart that's tender toward God and you reach out to him, it's really not that hard because God is not really that hard to please. And that's probably because he's so good and merciful and kind and forgiving and he has so much love toward God. All of us. Aren't you glad for that? The word of God has brought us something precious. Amen. So I've presented the, the doctrine of God. God bless you.